So welcome everybody. Thank you for coming back. I'm Jeff Feynman, a veterinary homeopath, certified holistic veterinarian, practicing up here in Connecticut, where we had three days of snow in a row, spring snow. Um, I don't think we had three days of snow all winter, but we had them last week. So uh, here we are on a kind of a bleak and dismal day, but um, hopefully we'll get to cover all your questions and topics. And it looks like we've already got a couple things that we want to talk a bit about. Um, I want to start by talking about Oh, sorry, I am um, trying to read, moderate, and talk, and I'm not good at doing all those things at once, and I'm going to lose all of our, all of our topics um, as they go off the screen, so please remind me if I don't cover anything. Um, so I introduced myself. Um, we are waiting for Christina Chambro, another holistic vet, and others that might be joining us for, for today's blab. But what we'll talk about before we even start is basically Becca's, um, Becca Kennedy, Rebecca is one of the, um, one of the medical had people down in, on the wings of the angels rescue in Florida. And I'm gonna have to agree with her kit as far as, um, you know, it's, it's very, very rare to see a truly healthy bitch. And as far as homeopathic treatment of the bitch, which is how we're going to optimize their, their caring and whelping and weaning and raising their pups, um, the homeopathic treatment really is based on the individual. So I'm gonna have to go to my fallback of, oh, of it depends. So depending on the, depending on the symptoms that are being displayed. Christina, hello, we can't see you because you've got a bright light Yep, I'm going to move. All right, thanks. Don't know why. It just wouldn't, it kept saying host wouldn't accept or something. <laughs> yeah, Bleb is, Bleb is still having some growing pain. Um, we were, we've got a couple of questions already about homeopathic treatment of basically breeding and gestating bitches and queens and then a little bit about treatment of or weaning of five-week-old puppies. So the first uh, the first point that Becca made, Becca is, is um, the medical person down at On the Wings of Angels Rescue in Florida. And she had the point of, do we need to treat bitches that are either going to be pregnant or that are pregnant homeopathically before they have puppies. So what, what's your thoughts? I just gave my thoughts about um, whether we actually need to treat them even if they are, you know, quote unquote healthy. You know, are they really healthy? Well, again, you know, we have to be looking at the early warning signs to see if they're really healthy. And, and if you're at a point in treatment where you've come to the point where you say, this is as healthy as this dog is going to get, then you don't, then you don't need to do any specific treatment before breeding or before, before um, uh, or, you know, after delivery or anything like that. Um, however, if they are not completely healthy at that point, which they very well may not be, then you may need to treat them, but you'll wait until their symptoms to treat them. Now, on the other hand, you could help along the whole process by doing many of the generally supportive self health, home health care that we've talked about. You could be offering Reiki every day while she was being bred during the pregnancy, during the delivery to the puppies and the mom, as well as anyone else in the house um, afterwards. 
and you could be doing acu you could be doing some acupressure which just generally stimulates and i don't find acupressure interferes with homeopathy you could be doing um massage gentle massage so any of those will just generally boost the health level and then of course if there are specific symptoms then we come in with homeopathy that'd be mine and I agree with what was said earlier that, um, you know, we want to wait until they're healthy to breed them. However, you know, there's health and there's health. So it, you may not just, you may be as healthy as you think you could be and you're still not fully there. I remember a Doberman I was treating who was a breeding Doberman. And when she delivered, we got her to where she was, she was pretty healthy. We, we felt she was in pretty good shape. This is decades ago with me, so maybe my standards weren't as high. And um, we bred and she had nine of the 10 puppies and she needed a cesarean for the 10th puppy. Uh, she was in West Virginia, so I wasn't there. Um, and I was sad. I mean, I told the owner, I said, well, I guess, you know, we really didn't get her healthy. And she said, well, you know, the, her mother and grandmother and great-grandmother and great-grandmother never ever delivered a healthy pup. So for her to deliver nine healthy puppies, even though one was really big and caught in a funny way and needed a C-section, was still a huge health improvement. So was she completely healthy? No. However, she was much better and then she continued the next litter she had she was able to deliver entirely by herself but i think actually one of kate's questions is just just a simple practical question for those of you who do breed and that is when do you start pulling the pups away from the mom if the mom doesn't naturally do them she's saying should we start separating them now or let them stay as long as they want and that's an answer. That's a question I don't have an answer for. And uh, as an experienced breeder, I'd love to hear uh, what Peck has to say about what she, what practice they perform with their, uh, with their litters. Personally, I usually let them self-wean. So let them, you know, four weeks is, is okay. You can certainly wean them then, but I would let them go longer, Kate. Um, especially if the mom is not, not pushing away and she's taking care of them. Um, you know, if they get to be three months old and they're still, still nursing, I'd say you probably want to give them a little bit of a hand. And you can do that best by separating, you know, by taking the pups away from the mom because some moms will just keep lactating, keep feeding the pups as long as they demand. And the pups will ask for food pretty much as long as they're able, so. Oh, actually, I guess one thing is, yes, the pups are still nursing heavily, but at, you should, by this point, at five weeks, start introducing a raw food diet. So as you introduce the raw food diet, you may find that the pups naturally don't nurse as much, and then she starts drying up. So I think part of it is, and you may be already doing that, um, so you can type that in, but that would be my additional thing um, is making sure certainly by the time they're eight weeks, they should be eating a normal amount of uh, fresh food. And then if they're nursing a little bit and the mom's happy, that's okay. Like Jeff says until about 12. And 12 that weeks. is a, that is such a great point that, you know, you need to start offering some of the raw food right away. And you can do that four to six weeks of age. Um, has the first food I would just do it, and I personally do it as more of a more of a chopped up and find a great food. But I know I've got breeder clients. I just give them a whole chicken quarter, and the pups just go crazy over it. I actually have a great story on that because I've always had cats um, as an adult, as a veterinarian. Actually, I had dogs as a child. Um, I've never really been around dogs raw feeding that much, and because I mostly have a phone call practice, I'm not doing house calls and seeing dogs eating. So I was visiting a friend once again. This is decades ago, and she had an eight-week-old puppy that she'd just gotten in the house maybe three days before, and she's from England. And she was about ready to put a big roast in the oven. I mean, you know, it was a big roast. And I said, like the end of it 
was was this big. And I said, why don't you just cut a hunk of that off? Now, I was thinking about, you know, a little hunk. She cut the entire end of the roast off about half an inch thick. And I didn't say anything. I thought, well, let's see what happens. That puppy, I mean, it was a big pup. It was a lab, I think. Um, that puppy sat under the chair and gnawed and gnawed on that huge piece of meat until it was all gone. He licked the floor. And then what was so cool is he hopped up and he just sort of trotted around the room a little bit and nosed here and nosed there. And then he came back and sat down for some petting. Whereas I've seen most puppies when they eat kibble or canned food, they eat a meal and then they just sort of their bellies get big and they just sort of collapse. And none of that happened with him. So it was really marvelous to just give this huge hunk of meat. I loved it. Yeah. And sorry. No, I was just going to say, you know, it, and that is one of the, uh, one of the things that you can see when you start to raw feed pretty much any animal. Um, and that is, it can be just so much better adjusted, so much better satiated. Um, aside from. So I, I would, I would actually have a question for the fast pup. If you believe in raw and you're doing part raw and part soak commercial, why? please type in why you're doing any commercial at all and not doing just raw. I'm really, you know, I'm curious always with people why they think they need to do some commercial. And there are lots of different reasons for that. So I'm curious about that fast pup. Yeah, yeah I know. I got the... Um the answer from many of my clients that do that, but I would also love to hear, um, hear what Kate has to say. And soaking the food implies, Kate, that you're using dry food, which, yeah, yeah. if you can use commercial mix, yeah, exactly, if you can use commercial. I mean, if you're gonna do, if you're gonna do commercial, do something like Honest Kitchen or one of those frozen raw foods. I mean, just we just need to stay away from that. I do like Dr. Beale's idea of starting at two weeks with mush. And even though the pups didn't eat it, they licked it off of each they, other. I love they, that. They're very, <laughs> very messy if you start at that point. I think that's so great, though, because the mom's going to clean them up anyway. So um, I really like that. OK, I. I want the pups to eat whatever their new owners are going to feed them. No, that's not necessary. Um, because you're working with your breeding dogs to have them be he as healthy as possible, and we're assuming they're pretty healthy, then um, healthy dogs can switch from one food to another food without any problem. So I would not offer commercial food until maybe once you've chosen the owner and once you know what the owner must feed, see if you can't um, get them onto Number one, have the conversation with the owner about what they're going to feed. They aren't going to feed raw. Are they willing to feed like Y songs or Honest Kitchen or one of the frozen, the dehydrated raw? If they are, then put the puppies on that for a couple of days before they go home. But give them a, don't do commercial while they're little. You want them to be as healthy as possible. And then, like I say, a few days before they're leaving, then you can put them on the diet they're going to be on, even if it's commercial kibble. But I would make sure you're doing whatever it is that they do, um, that they are going to be doing. So don't do it until then though, but good answer. That I can see you're thinking and on that. And the only thing I'd like to add at that point is um, one of my basic tenets for a good diet is variety. And I would love to see start offering variety, you know, to the young pups. And then when they go to their new home, they will not have the same problems that, that a dog that's had the same food, oh, you know, from day one has had. Um, so if you able to start the variety right away, that's gonna that's gonna help a lot, and that is, and that and variety is important. If you like, when you're talking to the new owners and they are going to be feeding dry food, dry commercial food, you want to encourage them to do variety there. Pick five brands, and or maybe three brands, 
and then rotate between the brands and rotate between the meat sources that are in each, you know, like one brand, three different meat sources or fish, et cetera. Because each brand has different um, levels of quality control. And so one brand may be putting in something that has a certain number of toxins in it. And another brand may be getting their meat from a source that has more problems, that it's a different problem. And another one is getting has ingredients that have a different type of a problem. So instead of saying feeding the same problem over and over and over again, you're giving a different range of amino acids and you're ameliorating the problems because each one's a little bit different. So even when they're good brands, that doesn't mean it's perfect or perfect for that dog. And as you, as you feed different foods to your, whether they're raw and you're getting them yourself and you know feeding big hunks and getting it from a local farmer, whether you're doing it yourself or you're purchasing food, um, you are, responsible for knowing what works the best. Um, I, I've mentioned this before, a gal who runs a natural health store had a big dog, 100 pound plus, and she discovered if she added one tablespoon of brown rice to the three cups of food that her dog was healthier. And with my cat, Ed, if he gets new cat vitamins, his hair coat is shinier, nothing else works, just that. So yes, um, anything Toland, I am saying rotate, I'm saying both, rotate the brands and number one, and number two, rotate the variety within a brand. And never think that because you're feeding some commercial, you can't feed any fresh. Um, Steve Brown's latest book, Unlocking the Canine Ancestral Diet actually says, and his examples of improved health come from people feeding one fresh food meal a week. Even one can make a big difference. So rotate everything, rotate some commercial, some fresh. And back to um, Fast Pup, um, sometimes if you talk with people um, who don't wanna feed raw, they're willing, they'll be willing to feed uh, lightly seared, meats. Their concern is is uh, bacteria. And you just have to let them know that it's ground meat that's the biggest problem because the bacteria are on the outside and get ground into it. And then in that environment, the bacteria explode. So E. coli outbreaks in people have always been in hamburger. Um, and so the, you can say the bacteria is on the outside. So if you're concerned about the bacteria, sear it you know, on the outside, you're still getting basically a raw food diet. And I don't care really if it's raw or cooked. I just want it to be fresh from the local purveyor. Yeah, act, actually, you know, one of the reasons we really don't recommend uh, the ground food is not just what Christina said, but um, if you ever read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, or you know about the, the meat grinding um, uh, business, the problem is the sanitation of the people that are working in the factories. And actually a lot of the bacteria, and they've done studies on this, a lot of the bacteria are introduced by the workers that are handling the meats that are getting ground. So it's actually a combination. And I just want to go back to the variety thing and again, and get back on the soapbox just to see that no matter what you feed, Kate, no matter what you feed, Heather, um, do not feed the same thing over and over and over again. And again, there's no better way to accentuate that than the melamine, um, Harwell melamine experience, you know, the China food from years and years ago. The reason that was such a tragedy is that people were feeding the same food day in, day out. If they were only exposing one meal here or one meal there to this toxic food, it wouldn't have created the same problems. So, you know, just. And in addition to that, we have to remember that there were millions of dogs and cats who ate the melamine poisoned food who didn't get sick. 
So we're back again to we're each born with a unique individual for field energy field that is susceptible to certain things. So there were there were dogs who probably ate one or two meals of the melamine and got really sick because they were super sensitive. And there were others who, because they were eating over and over again, just the melamine, they eventually got sick. And then there are others who didn't get sick at all. So we, we're back to it's that individual, you know, we're treating individuals and some individuals are born into this planet and they seem to be like designed to tolerate all the chemical toxins that are here and don't get sick. And others do. So um, it is individual. And I uh, warming. We have to talk, talk about, about warming. warming and I do see that Gail did join us, but I don't know if she's still caught up. Um, they had a, I mentioned before you came, Christina, that Gail had a, uh, an emergency that one of the kitties fell off, uh, one of the old kitties fell off a bed or a counter, and Gail was waiting, I think she said around 10.30 California time. She's going to have a uh, backup and hopefully we'll get to, to join us. So. Um, yep, we'll talk about worming, and Heather wanted to know about, uh, that's a great question, Heather, and the question is how often you change variety, uh, and the answer again is going to be it depends. It really depends on the individual. Um, we have, I know, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, we need, we need a t-shirt made up with that, that it, it depends. <laughs> Oh, we just yeah. just get it on a make a, a a thingy, and you can just hold it up. <laughs> Something on a stick, you know. For next week, <laughs> right? Exactly. It depends. Exactly, Heather. It does. Um, there are individuals. I mean, dogs are in their ancestral form adapted to eat a different food at every meal. I mean, think about, you know, dogs in the wild or dogs in, you know, Africa or, you know, India. They scavenge. They, whatever they find in the garbage, they grab. If they can see some dead on the side of the road, they eat that. Um, and it varies. Um, and on the other hand, many of them are eating the same meal every day. So if you have people, if they're in a village and the people in the village eat rice every day, and all the people have to eat is rice, then the dogs are gonna get rice. And then if they're lucky, they'll scavenge something different every day. And and people have actually um, found that genetically dogs have over the last few hundred years changed from wolves so that they do have some carbohydrate digesting um, genes. I'm not promoting that, but I'm saying they do have that. Um, and when you're rotating, I would never buy commercial food and keep it on hand unless I guess you could keep it in the freezer. Um, but I, you, you want to buy the smallest possible bag you can afford. And, um, you know, I just wouldn't feed ground meat very often. That's in, the, I, I just stay away from ground meat unless, you know, you just have to. Um, Pour simmering broth over it and cook it slightly. That's, you know, I don't know. Probably if you froze the ground beef first, that oh, might be. Oh, I've got one other, one other idea. There are a lot of them out there, but Amy and I are about to start every week or two uh, sending out crock pot recipes. So recipes that you can just throw your ground meat and veggies mm -hmm. and other things into a crock pot. But it's cook at a low, slow heat for hours and hours. Your Everything is safe. You won't destroy all of the enzymes. It's not the same as feeding a raw, a raw food, but it's certainly a lot better than most commercial foods. And it's something that you can do once a week and then just keep it in the fridge for, you know, for the week. And then in addition, and then, in addition that you can feed that for your main meal and then you give hunks of meat and hunks of chicken backs and necks and turkey necks um, in between. So you do both. 
So that would that would be good. It's just so many people say, oh, it takes so much time to feed my animal. And I say it's so easy if you cook at all. Now, for the people who don't cook, it is more of a challenge for sure. Our New York clients, Jeff, really had to educate us a bit, at least me. You know, when they said they didn't have a kitchen, I went, <laughs> really? And they went, yeah, I have a hot plate and a, a dorm size refrigerator. <laughs> So for those people, I had them wherever they went to dinner, they just ordered for a second person if they had a big dog and told them not to cook the meat. You know, it's not a local farm, but it's still, you, you have to figure out. Um, so absolutely, um, Heather, have schedule an appointment for your husband to talk to me or to Jeff, or if you're, so... I guess I have to ask, does that mean that your husband is doing the cooking? Because here's here's the way to have raw not be a hassle. You buy meat for your, if, if you're a meat eater yourself. Um, if you're not, you have to buy meat just for the dogs. So say you decide to have chicken. Uh, you're having chicken for dinner and you're going to have broccoli and you're going to have um, sweet potatoes. And that's gonna be the chicken, broccoli and sweet potatoes. So you take the breasts and maybe the legs off of the chicken and you cook that for yourself, for your family. You, so you put that in cooking and you set aside the rest of the chicken carcass. Hopefully you can get a fresh chicken carcass that has the giblets in it and you set those aside as well. Then when you're doing your broccoli and your sweet potatoes, you take the hard parts of the broccoli and instead of putting them into the compost or down the garbage disposal, you put them in the food processor. Then you cook the, the, the um, sweet potatoes and the broccoli and you pour the water from those into the, sweet, into the food processor instead of into the sink. Then you eat your meal and then you, instead of scraping your leftovers in the garbage, you scrape your leftovers into the food processor. If your dog is fairly healthy, you can scrape everything. If there's some rice, big deal, if they're pretty healthy. If there's you know, some quinoa, that's fine. If there was half of a bagel and cream cheese with lox spread on it, you put that in too. And then, the so at that point, it has taken no extra time, Heather, yeah, at but, all. But, 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 the extra time now, the extra time now comes, turn on the food processor, let it run for about five minutes while you're cleaning up the kitchen. And then you've got, that's your vegetable mixture. And then you have your raw meat and you just put the raw meat down and put the vegetable mixture down and you're done. And I think what Heather was saying is that, because if I remember how we talked about this, her husband is just against raw in general. They cook every day. They're, okay. They cook. You know, for themselves, they could get yeah. right. That's what she just said. Um, and I would love if SF Raw, San Francisco Raw, you know, chimes in a little bit because they've got, you know, she's probably got more, he or she, I'm not sure who's here, has more raw feeding experience than, you know, than 90% of all people out there. And I know, I, I believe Ginny is also here. Ginny is also a raw feeder and homeopathic. Uh, patient devotee who's got a huge wealth of information um, uh, as far as the raw broad diet. But yeah, um, I mm -hmm. think that Heather's, Heather's issue, Heather's husband's issue probably relates more to the bacteria and the cleanliness. Okay, well, earlier she said time, so that was why I was addressing that. But if you have five Labradors, then you can't quite do it just with what you're doing. You have to actually shop for them separately. Um, and so then then you do have to think ahead sort of in terms of what you're going to do. Um, what are the best resources, do you think, for raw? I, I think probably the book he should read would be the Steve Brown's Unlocking the Canine Ancestral okay. Diet. Get it. If he would read that one, Dr. Becker's, The Paleo Diet, and Ihor Basco. Ihor Basco cooks a lot of meat, um, but he does do raw, and he does maybe more grains than Jeff and I would do because he's a Chinese medicine practitioner. But um, I think those four books would be a good beginning. And I'm just writing now Lou's book. Give her a shout out. Uh, it's a great, she's a nutritionist and a Rottweiler breeder, I believe, and she has a book called Raw and Natural, which 
It's one of the few books I've got on my desk in the office. And she's got some great, great, very scientific, very uh, useful information in her book. Good. Oh, good. Um, she also has a good, a good Excellent. active Facebook uh, group page area. So you can go there and like her page as well. Um, and the other thing, given, that, Heather, that your husband and you do organic meals for yourself, then I can tell he has a consideration for the planet. So if you really talk to him also about the difference between the environmental footprint of commercial food versus the environmental footprint of you buying the ingredients from your local farmer and making it yourself, that, that may be, you know, maybe that'll be just a little bit to push him over the edge. And like you say, he'll follow your lead. Um, but... Maybe some of these clues will help you. And just remember, on the Dogs Naturally magazine does a great raw roundup. And then they have a Facebook page just for people who participated or who purchased the tapes uh, or the videos or whatever you purchase um, and proceedings. And um, on that, frequently, um, one of the issues that shows up in that um, on the Facebook page over and over again is I can't, I'm not sure I'm doing it right. Am I balancing it? Do I have the right ingredients? Which ingredients should I use? I'm so nervous and uptight and tense about this. So the, the answer for everybody is relax. There is no right, one right way because. No, it's a, there you go. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> That's right. Look at the way it does depend. It's all all about all about <laughs> individuality. Um, and when we were yeah. talking about the variety of the puppies, um, back to worms. We need to worms, do worms for sure and finish uh, natural puppy and kitten rearing. But you know, part of the part of the um, the hang up about feeding a balanced diet is when you deal with feeding the same food or the same meal day in, day out. That's really where the balance becomes more of an issue. Um, but if you're doing variety, if you're feeding the way nature intended and the way that you eat yourself, then certainly do not need to worry about um, balance to that degree. And Randy Wysong um, of Wysong Food Company, he's a brilliant author and very, very brilliant man. And he's written extensively about um, how you would need, what you would need in order to have a balanced diet. And actually what you would need is to know the individual digestibility of every single different amino acid in every single different animal. So it's virtually impossible. So maybe some of his books would be good. And finally, for anybody who isn't sure about the difference between raw and cooked, although of course I know in Chinese medicine, again, cooked does show up and it is needed definitely for some animals, but um, is the Pottinger, uh, Pottinger's cats book. They fed thousand of cat, thousands of cats over a 10 year period, one third on raw meat, raw milk and cod liver oil, one third on cooked meat, and one third on cooked milk, i.e. pasteurized. And only with tons of measurements, litter sizes, x-rays, bone density, all of that, it shows that only raw meat, raw milk, and cod liver oil cats were healthy. It took three generations to recover back to health. And when, they, um, when the whole experiment was over, only the raw meat, raw milk field had anything growing on it. Once they cooked the meat or cooked the milk, the stool from the cats made the land basically sterile. That's amazing. And he did a small study showing that if he was using grain fed meats, they were also not very healthy. And what's in commercial food? Grain fed meats by in general, a few of them are organic, but um, just start reading. <laughs> Pick one. Doesn't really matter. They're all good. Uh, probably Paleo Dog is the longest. Dr. Becker's is the shortest. So start. How long is the, the one you just mentioned by Lou Olson? Uh, an hour or two read, really. It's really it's very short. 
very good. And is it just it's, food or just food. yeah, raw and natural? And I okay. I pop link in there um, to one of Randy Weissing's articles that's on my website on pet food myths and you know the the myths Excellent. that we're talking about today. Um, and I see that Gail was trying to get on, but for some reason, Pleb won't let her on. I don't know what's going on. Well, it made me sign up or something, but then it didn't. So it's it was just being weird. So yeah, it, she may get on here, in sure. a minute. So, yeah, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Two puppies need routine worming. Christina? You go first. <laughs> I usually base it on, well, you have to pick your son up first, actually. Actually, the answer is. <laughs> Thank you. That's right. Yep. That's right. Because it's got to be based on the individual. Um, are there parasites in the line? Of there? Does mom have a history of roundworms? Might roundworms be hiding somewhere in her body and they've reactivated, you know, and now the pups have them? Um, do the pups have diarrhea? Are the pups having any GI pumps whatsoever? Have you checked a stool sample from the pups? Um, but I would say that, you know, in general, if you use a product like Titamaceous Earth or Pyrantal Pamoid, you're probably not going to be doing a lot of, you know, a lot of harm to them. Um, and there's Gail, what is she waiting for? What's uh, which one uh, is Pyrantal Pamoid? Strong, Jeff, is that Strongid? Okay. What I what I've said has is um, Piperzine still it around? Is. Yep. So when I see um, with puppies, if they, I, I say do a stool sample at eight weeks and another one at 12 weeks. That's sort of one of the times, just take some poop into the vet. <laughs> Support your local vet with stool samples. <laughs> That's all they're good for. Well, I, you know, I, 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 <laughs> now, that uh, wasn't nice. They're really good exactly. for diagnostics and for emergencies and all sorts of wonderful things. But um, if you get roundworms, then what um, I would use, what I recommend is just piperzine because they're specific to roundworms. And so you're not giving anything else. But I also do feel that parental pamoid is pretty safe. And because it does hook worms and roundworms both, that's good. Does, it doesn't do whip, but it does it. So. Jeff? Yeah. I don't think so. Okay. So I like to find, you know, what worms they have. Um, and... Uh, 12 weeks. What did you say? Did you say do, do that at 12 weeks, yep. Jeff, if you, you felt they had worms? Then or even before okay. that, for sure. And do you think they sh if they're going to do it, they should follow up in two weeks, like two weeks? And or three weeks, somewhere in there. Because you want to get your okay. rounds and your hooks, for sure. And Stranger will do that. And let's see what's going on here. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's okay. You go ahead with that. So the, um, it, the problem is if you are a breeder, um, you then need to be educating your, um, you know, the new dog owners about what they're going to be doing. And the key is to get them with a holistic vet. Hey, Gail. Oh, Yay. <laughs> Whoops. Bye, Gail. Here today. I like life here today. Uh, <laughs> we got to see her joyous, happy face for at least a moment. She'll be back. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to pop a link in there. It's at, that is actually a link to um, my housebreaking and new puppy report. So anyone that's on, um, on today or anyone in general can just click on that link. You'll join our online. Oh, she's back. He'll join our uh, join our online um, holistic pet care community and get the uh, free report about housebreaking your puppy and just some good best practices. And hopefully, we'll be following up on um, with other good natural rearing best practices very soon. So, Gail, what happened with the kitty that fell? Oh wow! He um, 
he literally climbed over me in the night. This is um, this is Tarka. He's very much towards the end of his life. He's in hospice care. Um, however, in his mind, he's a young, strong lion, and he flatly refuses to not sleep on my bed with me at night. And in the night, he climbed over me, and the next, well, I was fast asleep. All, all I heard was a scuffle, and he hit the floor. And at that time, he got himself back up onto the bed, and he sat back down in my arms and we fell asleep. And it was only, oh, actually around breakfast time that we discovered he was bleeding. And he's he just, he's got a, a nasty hematoma and it had bled and that, that's kind of why I was so late because I wanted Blank and my vet tech to be here because Tarka is not the kind, you know, his name is Russian and he's a tough guy and mm. standing him over the sink and trying to sluice him off was not the most pleasant experience I've had in a while. Um, he wasn't very amenable, but I just wanted to wait for Blanca to get here so we could kind of get him a little cleaner. But he's had, he's had Arnica 10M. He's not bleeding. He says he's absolutely fine and it doesn't look very nice, but yeah, we'll see. He says he's fine and that's what counts. So how long did it take you to give him the Arnica? Um, this morning or after my email? Oh, he'd already had it when you emailed me. Oh, good, I good, was, good. It's always an interesting situation that I get caught in here because my instinct, as soon as I saw what was happening, I um, I went and made up Arnica 10M. And then, you know, the little bird in my brain said, you know, he's he's at the end of life. Um, I'm talking with his vet every day. I probably shouldn't just go ahead and do this because I have had vets, you in particular, Jeff, who have said, hey, you know, I don't know if I would have rushed to the acute. I think I might have done so-and-so. So I've always got this little man on my shoulder saying, hey, you might make the wrong decision. So I called Diana and waited for her to call back. So he had it pretty quickly, which again, and I'm sure you've said it before, is one of the benefits of working with a homeopath in an emergency situation like that. I mean, obviously he wasn't, in such an emergent situation that I needed to run him straight to the vet. So I had the luxury of telephoning my vet and having her call me back so we could assess the situation, which is just, I mean, it's one of the great wonders of homeopathic care. You don't necessarily have to go to the vet, especially with older animals that are nervous and you mm -hmm. just don't want to disturb them. So hopefully we have a good outcome here. So uh, as Monty Python would say, Tarka did say that right. it was just a flesh wound, like Kimmy said. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I actually think it shook me up more than it did him, and it was quite a lot of blood, but, you know, he's, he's completely unfazed by it. So good. Great. Well, that's a good outcome. But um, in general, you know, Arnica is pretty much never going to interfere if there really is trauma. So, and I think that the um, speed that you do it is important, but just doing it at all is is critical because, you know, there are cases, I mean, I just, last week had a case of, of a lame dog that trying to go resolve almost a year later. Wow. So you just, you never know. Mm. I know of a blind person who'd been in this horrible accident, had been blind ever since a train accident. And 40 years later, they gave a dose of wow. aconite and he could see again. Isn't that incredible? Pretty amazing. Wow. That's a, a wonderful story. And it. Well, both of them, you know, lame a year, blind yeah. for 40 years. It's, it's, for that dog, that was almost 40 years. <laughs> and Heather, uh, when was your pup born? that was vaccinated and had his insult given so early. March 29th was, oh, so what is that? On oh, under two months, March 29th, yeah. Um, Christina, what are your thoughts? On the, uh -huh. the puppy that's gotten all that stuff? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, that's my thoughts. So most puppies do fine with that. They're ab absolutely fine. So that's why we don't recommend giving through you right away or hypericum right away or listen right away or whatever. Um, I would go ahead. I wouldn't do another strongid. 
I certainly wouldn't do any more vaccines until it's time for the rabies. I would start keeping a journal. I would look at the early warning signs of illness. I would, um, as, if there are any symptoms, then of course you, you call, um, it. you work with, with Heather, them, Jeff? With Heather, I, oh, yeah. Are you there, Beth? I have with Heather? Yeah, so then, then if there are any symptoms at all, then you would call Jeff. If you, if you want, um, there is something, uh, flower essence called um, vaccine detox by spirit essences. And I don't find anything wrong with using that. Certainly if you're attuned with Reiki, you can offer Reiki every day and just see if there's a particular draw, if you notice a draw and then continue to offer it. Um, but at this point, I'd just be looking for whatever the constitution remedy is. I wouldn't do anything specific. Yeah, no, I, I, Jeff? I no, certainly all the strangid as a young pup doesn't really bother me. The early vaccine does bother me, and I certainly would not want you to further insult, you know, your puppy's immune system, Heather. Um, by not giving any vaccines, you actually probably help optimize his life and health later in life. So the fewer you give, the better, um, in my opinion. And I, I know that's you know certainly now, but not what your local vet is going to tell you. And you know, part of the part of working to naturally rear your pups is going to be finding a local veterinarian that's willing to work with you and respect your wishes. Because if you go to most vets with a twelve-week-old pup or ten-week-old pup, and they're quote unquote due for vaccines. If you ask them not to give the vaccines, you may get a hard time or have a hard time. But I think that, you know, it's pretty clear that in most cases, the vaccinations given at a young age can negatively affect the, their developing immune systems. I think that the new, the new research is showing that early age vaccinations can be among the most harmful. And so definitely I would not recommend fast pup vaccinating puppies at seven weeks. There's just no need yep. for that at all. And Kate had another question earlier that I wanted to go back to, but I forgot what it was now. All right, sorry. And I and I do, for everybody who's on this call and listening to these, I'm sure you'll, you would really enjoy the, um, I posted it, I thought it would go over to the Q side. Oh, there it did. Uh, learn more on the Learn It Live this next week, starting on Sunday, the, the whatever it is, 10th, um, are going to be 70 different wonderful spiritual speakers. And I'm going to be speaking at 1.30. Some, my topic, something like, healthy animals nurture your health. So we'll talk about how making the best choices for your animals will actually help you make the best choices for yourself and nurture your spiritual health. Um, so check it out. And there, I've done a month of courses and then I'll do one later um, in April on, um, on puppies and kittens. So I've learned a lot that I'm going to use for my course. So you know, you and I get to help each other out this way, Jeff. It's great. And before we go <laughs> Okay. On. Oh, we have a gr great new person here. Yanni Rotem. Um, Yanni, I'd love to know where you live. That would be a wonderful, that would really help us. Um, and I'd recommend that you go to Dr. Jeff's website and to my website and start reading. Uh, that's your very first, and that, that's going to help you understand. A holistic vet is a person who is trained as a conventional veterinarian who then has learned to look at health from an, a holistic standpoint where we understand that there's an energy field that you're born with that is different in each animal and has different sensitivities and tends to get ill in specific ways. So rather than treating the symptoms and trying to get rid of the symptoms, we attempt through homeopathy, Chinese medicine, chiropractic to rebalance the energy field so that all of the symptoms get better 
and the animal feels great, lives a long life. And part of it does have to do with feeding a good nutrition and um, feeding a fresh food diet is the best. So definitely re-listen to this whole talk and check and out Dr. Do. Jeffs and my websites. Oh, it's, she yep. said she was in Israel. Yep. Oh, Dr. Renee, yes, That would be my, my next step. Um, yes, and I'll certainly pop a link in there or Christian, I can pop a link in there. I don't know if you have a, um, hey, what is a holistic vet link on your website, but we're just about picking up and we missed I do. One question I was scrolling down through the questions and I see Nanny asked about, she said she's moving homes and she's got kitties that have always lived in the same place, a secure and secluded life. And they're moving to a bigger house and they'll be sharing a garden with the dogs. So do you have any, any adaptation? Well, one, yeah, one thing that I think would be really important is to work with an animal communicator to help the cats adjust to the change. I think that's important. And then you can go on with some others while I look for um, the meat. Okay, yeah, I was actually just also browsing. Rescue remedy, Reiki, those would also be good. Um, yep. And I didn't notice, but I guess, but I mean, just mentioned that we, that our esteemed guest just joined us. And of course we're finishing up and hopefully he'll be able to join us next week. And I don't see where, Dr. Dr. yeah, I don't Oh, I see. So, yep. Okay. I've got, um, I now have um, Ronit's email. This may not be the thing to, <laughs> this may be your personal email, but go ahead and use it anyway. She won't care. Um, and I couldn't find her website. So uh, and go ahead and use that because uh, they're not that. And there are several others in Israel, but she'll help point you to that direction. And if you go to the Dr. Jeffs and my website, we have a links page that gives you all the organizations. So you go to each organization and you look for who else is in Israel. But I've trained several Israeli vets. They've come to the US to take my homeopathy courses, which and I offer for lay wanna, people as well. If you wanna email me, um, and I did actually, Yanni, just drop in a link if you wanna grab that report that'll give you my email and all the other information. Um, certainly can do that. Uh, Christina, before we go, I just want to mention that Dr. Jeffrey Broderick, who is the formulator of the fabulous cornucopia supplements and food, he's joined us here today and he was supposed to be on with us today. He was going to be our special guest star, but um, um, I see uh, that he does not have a mic or, or yeah, or any way to call in. Um, so, okay. Dr. Botrick, we're hoping that you can join us next week. Yep. Um, next week. Yep. You will need a mic and camera to do it because it is a, um, no, there is no way to really just call in, unfortunately. Actually, you know, if you have a phone, an iPhone, you can do it from your iPhone or iPad. It actually works quite well from the iPhone, iPad. So, anyway, I want to say thank you everyone for such a fantastic uh, turnout. Now we're working hard to get the word out and it looks like some people are listening. So Christina, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, everyone, all right. we'll see you next Thanks week. Again, Take care. Bye -bye. And we will see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.